Greetings once more. Thank you so much for being patient uh, with us for waiting it to, uh, for it to be 18.03. It is three minutes past six on my watch. I would like to thank you so much for taking the time uh, to coming through to this information session. My name is Shumani Kwashaba. I'm the head of programs uh, department at the BMF. I would like to say greetings once more. Allow me to make a special mention to the leadership of the BMF in attendance uh, with us tonight uh, to welcome my co-panelists to Mr. Eric Mafuna and also the BMF members that are in attendance tonight and all the guests that answered the call to this invite. Thank you so much for coming through. Allow me to just share my screen right now. Yes, thank you for the for 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 coming through to this outlier leadership program information session. Um, let me just do a quick recap of what we have done thus far. Last year, we started to host outlier leadership program master classes that were presented by Mr. Mafuna, uh, Mr. Mondenlovu, Mr. Philip Bakaokotel, and the sessions were beautifully directed by Dr. Sibongile Vilakazi. Thank you so much um, to, to you for, I know you did a great work because the numbers of the people that are on this call uh, show that people are hungry for more and they'd like to know how to come into the program, how to participate and take part into the program. Um, so today, we, we last time we went through the details of what is the outlier leadership program. Um, we also went into details of explaining some of the leadership tools, some of the leadership handles that are covered in this program. Uh, why are we here today? So last year during the last uh, masterclass webinar, we communicated that before the end of last year, before we go through uh, to the program due to the holidays, we are going to say what is next. Um, we communicated that we are going to have an information session uh, that will be able um, to tell the people um, what is the syllabus of the program, what is the enrollment process, what are the fees of the program, and uh, what are the requirements of the program. Um, so today, that's what we are here to do. That's what we are gathered here to do. So maybe just as a recap um, and also an introduction to those that were not able to come to the masterclass last year, those that are coming today for the first time, what is the Outlier Leadership Program? Um, we call it in short, the OLP. It is a program that provides essential strategic understanding as well as personal insights and skills for the practice of leadership in our ever-changing world. The program does this by exposing and teaching uh, leadership tools, strategies, and tactics, and give the delegates insight of how to execute uh, the leadership duties. Furthermore, by attending this program, delegates will be able to identify leadership styles. They are the origin of their own leadership styles and how to improve those that style and navigate around different leadership styles in order for them to lead effectively. Uh, the BMF offers this program in partnership with the African Leadership Development Program. I have mentioned before um, that I am not presenting alone today. I have the, the principal um, of the program, Mr. Eric Mafuna. He was uh, there uh, last year to give us more insight about what the program is about. So today he is going to delve more into how come and how this leadership program is different from the programs that are out there in the market and ac the actual syllabus that those who come through and enroll will go through. Um, I know he's ready for me. And uh, with that, allow me to hand over the, the screen to uh, Mr. Eric Mafuna. Thank you, sir. You may take over. I'm going to stop by sharing my screen. OK. Uh, thank you, Shumani. And good evening, everybody. And welcome on board. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I've got. I think I've got 10 minutes or so to present, and then we, we probably will take some questions and answers. Um, I do have a presentation. I hope I'll just bear with me when I switch it on. 
Is that right? Yes, we can see it, sir. Okay, let me, is that on? Yes, it's good. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go rather quickly. Um, I've got several slides and I'm not going to, to read them or, or just simply speak to them. Tonight's um, session is um, a follow-up on the number of presentations that we have done. Uh, we've been promising you all the time, uh, you know, about this up, outlier stuff, outlier stuff, but today you're going to see the nuts and bolts of, of, of what this is about. Um, I wasn't able to send you this teaser about Davis Bar, but uh, I'll, I'll ask Shumani to send it to you after the show so we can start there. But ignore it for now. The, <clears throat> the starting point, uh, for those who want to know, why outlier leadership? And why is it not like any other leadership models that are there, transformational mod you know, leadership model, um, authentic, uh, and so many others? Um, this model, this approach is de designed specifically to deal with problems that South Africans experience inside organizations or in any other area where they have to exercise leadership. Second, it is based on a number of what we call autobiographical models. These are models that are based on people's experience. So it's not new in the sense that it is coming up with you know, a lot of new concepts. The only thing that is new here will be the outlier. But otherwise, it dips in into other models that are based on experience. We call them autobiographical models because they're based on the experience of people that have been practicing leadership. I'll give an example. When you talk about authentic leadership, we feature people that have written about authentic leadership, like um, Bill George and, and a whole host of others. When you talk about adaptive, adaptive is about uh, the ability to be flexible, to learn, to read the situation and make the adjustments that you need. Uh, ethical and moral, I mean, this is in the forefront of where we are in South Africa. Everybody's calling for ethical leadership, for moral leadership. And then of course, there's the collaborative side of things, which talks about um, the need for us to share with others in whatever work we do. Um, the old African expression simply says that there's nothing you will achieve alone. You will achieve, achieve a little bit, but when you are working with others, you're going to achieve a lot. And that's where collaboration comes from. And a lot of this concept about Ubuntu and, and so forth, uh, you can hang them into this area. There's another model that has come up into the market, which is a fancy, fancy word like quantum. Uh, ignore the, the, the fanciness of the word. It's based on the quantum theory. But in essence, when applied to leadership, it is talking about the interconnectedness of things, that human activities, human life, human experience um, is, is driven by the fact that everything we do is interconnected. So you are not alone. You are like an atom that works in collaboration with, with other people. And then the last piece is the servant leadership. Again, this is talking about um, the selflessness that a leader has to show. So if you take these concepts, authentic, adaptive, ethical, moral, collaborative, quantum, and servant leadership, we have borrowed concepts, uh, insights, wisdoms from these concepts, and we've tied them together under the concept of outlier. I'll come back to the issue of outlier afterwards. Um, 
we are moving away from the old um, fashioned concepts of authoritarian leadership, you know, the big men, the, <clears throat> sorry, the big men theory. These models are fall under the, con the, the category of command and control. Um, this is very much discredited. But if you look in South Africa and a lot of our organization, in part because of the apartheid way, in part also because of the um, militaristic um, approaches that were used in running business, particularly parastatal or so-called SOEs today. If you go into a lot of the SOEs that were founded in the times of apartheid, um, this command and control is rife. It is possibly still taking 90% of what, what managers do or what leaders do. They believe they must tell you and you must follow. They believe uh, you must listen or watch discipline. Discipline simply means for them that you must be scared of them. You must hold them in awe, right? Um, then there's a, the last, last piece, which is the tradition-driven leadership concepts. Um, we are going to deal with a lot in, of this when we bring in the likes of Nelson Mandela's work because to the last moment when he was writing about his stuff or speaking about leadership, he kept reminding us that we mustn't throw the baby with the bathwater. There's a lot that modern leadership practice can still benefit or borrow from traditional leadership as practice in South Africa. So if you can look at the current screen that I've just popped up here, um, the origins of the outlier leadership are several. On the left-hand side where you have the map of Af South Africa, uh, that refers to the research that we did between 2000, well, 1998 and 2004. Uh, we canvassed all cultural, racial, ethnic groups in South Africa to try and understand their leadership experience. How have they experienced leadership up to this day? Um, it, it has taken us more than 10 years to make sense out of that research. And the foundation of that research is now fed into what we call the outlier leadership. The second part is borrowed from Nelson Mandela's concept of moral leadership. Um, those of you who are keen to join on uh, join this program, uh, I must encourage you right from the get go, get yourself a copy of a long walk to freedom because it is one of our major textbooks. We are going to interrogate Nelson Mandela's um, life, particularly the earlier part, his upbringing, uh, because it brings in the outlier part. Uh, he helps you deal with a lot of these things that uh, many of us um, we encouraged um, to forget or to forego, you know, bad experience, a stupid mistake that you make, what the French call faux pas. Um, there are a lot of those things in Mandela's book. If you look from Kuhn when he starts, all the way, even when he, he was uh, taking over the, the leadership from Conto uh, even in the university, he keeps showing you where he was out of depth. He was the, the guy that was least sophisticated. He was more of a country bumpkin. Uh, for example, uh, these students and these colleagues were not invited. They sneak into a dance, a dance hall where the lecturers and the professors and their wives were dancing. And Mandela fancied himself to be one of these, you know, the smooth dancers. He grabbed the wife of a professor, danced with her, and then afterwards, uh, his own professors were looking down and wondering, who is this guy? Why does he think he's got the right to come into, you know, a, a teaching staff function and dance? And when he reflects on that, 
you start realizing how deep a hole he dug himself into. He had, they didn't scold him, but he learned from that. So from Nelson Mandela, there are a lot of these things we call, and we're going to come back to, crucibles, where he says, you're going to benefit a lot. You learn a lot about yourself by re-examining the experiences that you buried away. You, 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 know, you dismiss them as irrelevant because at the time when th things happened, they were embarrassing. Um, we call them misfortunes. They were catastrophic and, and so forth and so forth. But the fact that we left these experiences behind, we shortchanged ourselves because if you look at your leadership capacity, your leadership character, a lot of these things that would strengthen your, your, your character, who you are, what you are all about, a lot of it, the lessons have been buried in those crucibles. So we're going to use Nelson Mandela because it makes it easy for us. Uh, and it's one of our own to learn by going through that. The book looks very big, but actually the story is, is, is much easier to, to deal with in terms of the work that we are going, going to be doing. And then the, <clears throat> The other elements uh, from Nelson Mandela, uh, we're going to be dealing with the question of values. In my life, Nelson Mandela is the only leader who has got the capacity to help you understand, not define, but understand what values are, understand what character is about, what character habits are all about. So we are going to deal with those things through Nelson Mandela and a few others. Uh, I've already talked about the self-centered uh, root contract, construct, which is, we dealt with those, is based on experience. Um, from one of the, the, well, the leadership guru of our time, Warren Bennis, um, talks about in, in a book called Geeks and Geezers, he talks about the roadmap to leadership development. <clears throat> and in there, he, he talks about, um, you must have an idea, an idea that came to you from childhood and has been knocking around in your head. It is something you said, I would like to do this in life. Uh, it will be very interesting for us, for those who are going to participate, to go back and pick up that idea, clean up so that you, you, you put it to work. He also talked about the era, the defining times of your life. In South Africa, uh, broadly speaking, apartheid is the center of uh, things for us. It defined the era in which we, de we developed. My time was consumed by apartheid, by having to deal with apartheid issues. When I look at my children, my younger children, their era has got nothing to do with apartheid. Their era is democracy. So if you are looking at leadership from the two angles, apartheid versus democracy, it's chalk and cheese, but we need to be able to understand the experiences from uh, your era. Um, <clears throat> the third concept is crucibles. I've alluded to it already. Crucibles are bad, painful, incidents, painful experience, uh, where when it happens to you, particularly from an African perspective, um, you start thinking that it's bad luck, uh, someone has wished it on me, or for that matter, others even think that I've been wished, I've been bewitched. Uh, that's why I experience these terrible things. It can be a very lonely uh, childhood, uh, take it from me, and a lot of you I know have experienced similar things. Crucibles are not the easiest, the nicest thing to, to, to experience when you're young, especially when the majority of your peers and associates do not seem to experience this because they, they operate in, in, in a group space. So we're going to come back to this. And in actual fact, it's one of the center, center point when we go back to Mandela 
and the other um, people that we're going whose books whose books we're going to work through uh, we're going to deal with crucibles related to the concept of crucibles is uh, Charles Handy uh, in his book the second curve <clears throat> it's it's talking about growth curves uh, it is talking about the fact that you need to reinvent yourself. I think if you use modern jargon, it says you must reimagine, you must repurpose, you must reinvent yourself. This is why the growth curve comes, comes in. In other words, as Charles Handy says, you are not only just a twice born. Many of us have been born six, 10 times. I think I must have been born 15 times. The number of time I have to change the model of who I am, the, 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 the person that I am. When I look at the background where I grew from to where I am today, there must be many, many iterations of Eric Mafuna. Okay. And then he also talks about capacity. This is about leadership capacity and skill sets. The last point that Warren Bennis talks about, which is incorporated in the, <clears throat> the, leader, the leadership program is the issue of having to teach yourself to be relevant or to be able to think like young people of today. Teach yourself the capacity to be relevant in another generation. You will begin to understand why Mandela was so attached to children. Why Mandela was so attached to young people. Even as he was going through prison, Mandela never thought himself, of himself as an old guy. He was always young, young in mind, young in, young in thoughts, uh, young in creativity. So what it means is that if you are older, you must learn to think like your successors, your younger generation. And by the way, it also says the younger generation must learn to think like old people yeah, without being out of date. Understand where these ideas come from. Um, this is where, for example, the idea of cath cathedral mindedness comes in. Smart leaders, outliers in particular, have got the, the, the creativity to think about projects that are going to outlast them, outlive them. Yeah? They think about something that is going to be here, maybe even a century or two um, after they're dead. That's what I think the BMF should be aiming towards. It's not a, you know, a journey come lately. I don't think the BMF should be something you know, that survives for 20 years or 30 years. We are just in our infancy, we are about 50. Can you imagine what the BMF is going to be uh, two centuries from now? The idea is there. It is building a home for young South Africans, um, building leadership that drives new concepts, uh, new projects rather. So that's on the right hand side. On the left hand side, where you talk about outlier leadership specifically, here are things that we didn't speak about in the past. The outlier child, um, when you know, or if you need to know whether you are an outlier or not, as an outlier, you dealt with a lot of what, of what they call primal cues or primal stimuli. At a very early age, you were exposed to situations at home, at school, in the playground. These issues required you, they are primal cues. They required you to make wise decisions. A young man I met in December, I admire a lot, called Seppo. When I was talking to him about this, he said, you know, one of those primal cues you're talking about, at a very, very early age, I, I decided, oh, I think my time is up. He said at a very early age, he decided uh, he must leave his parents' home 
go and live with his his aunt because he, he wasn't going to get enough time to study, to get to understand who he was. At a very early age, possibly about five or six, he decides to go and live with his, with his aunt. And he says, I'm here because I made that decision. Can you imagine the decisions that we make at a very tender age, five, eight, 10, even 14, because you have to deal with these kind of situations. Either a parent was absent, largely a, a father, and in some instances, a mother, or both of them were not there, they were dead, or they were just not present in your life. Yeah? Uh, you start having to make those decisions. These are things that we are going to talk about in the, um, in the, uh, the, the program. Let me hasten to take you through to the model. We talked about this. We talked about um, values. You can see I just picked up a handful of these values. Many of us believe we know what values are about. We can actually recite them. But how we negotiate these values on a day-to-day -day basis, it is a mystery. Most of us know a lot about values, but we don't understand what they're all about. And one of the challenges of the outlier leadership is to help you make sense of this, your personal values for status, and then see how you negotiate with other people around you that there's an alignment between your own personal values, their values, even with your own companies. Companies talk about their values, but those values are seldom aligned to the values of the employees. It is a question of take it or leave it. If you don't like it, you can leave and go and find a company that's going to, you know, whose values you're going to like. That's not what is supposed to be in real life. We need to understand this. And this is one of the areas where we are going to spend a lot of time, okay? Um, I'm not going to spend time on this. Very briefly on this slide, those of you who can see, um, we are, we've selected about eight to 10 uh, leaders um, from their autobiographies or even some of their biographies, because there's a lot that we can learn about um, outliers from them. We consider these individuals to be the quintessential, yeah, they are really the interpreters, the, 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 the exponents of outlier leadership. It starts with the slave, um, American black slave, a guy called Frederick Douglass. Uh, we will go through his work. You will love it. Of course, our own uh, Nelson Mandela, as I said, we're going to run through his material, his books and all that. Then you'll have to pick one or two of the Kennedy brothers. Yeah, uh, there's a lot to learn there. I'm giving you this because these are the, the books that and some of them I have met in my life and they influence my approach to, to growing a, a leadership style of an outlier. Steve Jobs is one of those, Barack Obama is another one. And then the Satya Nadella, uh, the, the, the current CEO of uh, Microsoft. There's Henrik Hofmeier. Uh, I've included him here because uh, he has a story that it's Africans, African story, but it's got African um, roots to it. Uh, we, will, we will look into them, him. Warren, Warren Bennis I've mentioned. Then there's Bill Clinton. Um, one young uh, Chinese born uh, American citizen back to China, Ping Ping Fu. Uh, she wrote a book called Band Don't Break. Um, there's a lot to learn there <clears throat> on the issue of um, you know, working yourself through some of the toughest things that young people have to go. You read this book, you wonder 
Why on earth should society subject young people to this? I guess, you know, in my time, um, I experienced Steve Biko, um, him going through something similar. And then of course there's Gandhi who also went through similar experiences. Okay. Uh, Shuman, you'll tell me when to stop, okay? Yes, sir, I will, we still have time. Okay, um, I've talked about these concepts. Now, we will send you, Shumani will send you, we have a, a syllabus that, that at the moment stretches up to more than 60 weeks. Um, you don't have to attend all 60. The idea is that along the way, if we take uh, 2021 as the foundation year, we will be able to bring in a lot of people, uh, group them into cohorts according to the experience. So we will have beginners, we will have the intermediate, we'll have the advanced, we'll have also maybe even the master class so that we can use the, the, the material that covers all those uh, 60, 60 weeks. Um, I think a lot of people by, you know, by week 36, you'll have covered a, a lot uh, that we have to do. So I'm not going to read everything, but Shumani has got the program and you can study it at your leisure. Um, you can three, see week three to 10, uh, we're going to be talking about how does one become an outlier leader or an outlier person? Uh, what are the circumstances that, you know, um, turn one into an outlier? Is it a matter of choice to be an outlier or is it something that is forced upon you? I believe uh, you don't have a say in choosing whether you become an outlier or not. Okay, uh, so it runs on, as, a, as I've said, um, we will we'll look at the 10 exemplars of outlier leadership, and then we will deal with <clears throat> those concepts, leadership concepts that I talked about, authentic um, leadership, uh, adaptive capacity, ethical, moral, and then we will look at collaborative, uh, quantum, seventh leadership, command and control, and so forth. We will extract um, value from the various models, okay? Um, I've already talked about this. I'll just illustrate. I'm not going to go on presenting, but you can see for yourself, you know, by week 45 to 52, we'll be talking about the issue, the practice, practice, the practice of leadership. This is when we start looking at performance because a, lo a lot of people go into leadership programs hoping that they'll improve their performance. They end the program without actually understanding the ins and out of performance. One of the things we are going to do right up front will be the issue of performance. How do you improve, improve your performance? How do you improve your personal mastery? You know those things where we talk about emotional intelligence. Our approach is very different from anything that you've dealt with yeah, um, in any leadership program. Okay, so it goes on up to 60. I can stop you. And then it, 61 to 63, that's when we start doing the assessments and what have you. Okay, so I'll, I'll get up. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for, for staying on to the call. I see that uh, not, no people, and the number increased as, as you were talking. Um, I am going to really go through the, the administration of things. What is next now? How much does it cost? Um, all those questions. Allow me to share my screen. Okay, so how, 
how much does it cost? What is next? Um, as I said today, that's that's the day where we are discussing that. Um, there are no application fees, as in there's no 250 that we need or 1,000 that we need non-refundable. So um, it's uh, we don't need application fees. Um, the delegates of the program, though, once enrolled or you know as part of the selection process, they need to be members of the BMF, paid up members of the BMF. Uh, the program will cost 10,000 per delegate of the program. Uh, the duration, as we heard, Baba Funa um, elaborating, they will be 60 weeks. And um, what are the, the entry requirements? Really, this is for a business owner, uh, someone who is employed, someone who's not even uh, employed or having a business. Um, it's about leadership skills. You, you heard uh, Mr. Mafuna explaining what the program is all about and how um, he went into past that we are going to be able to, to group people as they come into the program um, according to, 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 the, to the different classes, according to the different um, qualifications, uh, working experience that we, we will get. And then how do you enroll? Right now you're excited, you want to be part of the program. What is next? Um, I'd like to really submit out there that we, we've had a long discussion in the office about how different this program is for, from any other program that we, uh, we offer, that BMF or any other program I've been part of where um, anyone can be part of the program and uh, you, know, you, you come in and then it picks you up where you are and you, you leave the program knowing something else that you can go home and, and implement. So we, the program is called Atlaya and uh, Mr. Mafuna gave an example of how an outlier leadership um, uh, person has a different approach to life. So we are taking a different approach uh, to this program. So after this, this session today, um, going forward, we are going to send through a link to everyone who's in the session. Um, and uh, that link is, is a link to a form where we are going to really ask you the standard question, your names and surname, um, your, your qualifications, um, what do you know about leadership, so that with that information, once we have received it, we are then able to group um, all the applications that we have found. Um, once we have everything, um, we'll be able to tell uh, the participant when the program can start, when the plan can start. Um, you have heard him saying that we, we're gonna have beginners, we're going to have people that are advanced in their leadership understanding. So you might find that when we respond to you um, it, and your friend has uh, a different answer, it's because of how we have framed your, your class and the particulars. Once we, 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 we receive then your acceptance that you're going to be part of the program, then we will communicate when the first uh, date of your class is going to happen. Um, I must say that the, the form as well is, 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 is very unique. We are going to be asking you um, how often do you want the program to take place in a week? We are going to ask you what time in a week. We have sat down and really realized that this is a lifestyle program. This is a program that when someone has gone through it, they need to go back into their everyday life and implement what they have learned. So um, we want people to really understand that it's not a certification issue or a certification program, but a program where you're coming in um, to, to, to get in some skills, to, to learn some more, some more information, some more knowledge, and go back into, into, into applying that. So we, we want the number of, of uh, fallouts, if we may, to be non-existent or, or very, uh, very minimal. So we really want to cater this program to the people that are going to be enrolling into the different classes. So once we have, as I said, received your forms and we have evaluated everything and we send you back your, your acceptance letter and your particulars of when the program will happen for you, then we are going to start um, the, the plans. We plan to really be concluded or have concluded the entire enrollment process in the in the month of February. Um, if we can start some classes in February, that would be great. But with that, all I'm saying is that we are ready. Um, the admin staff is ready. 
at the BMF and also at the African Leadership Development to really kickstart this year and, and understand what this leadership is and all that it has to offer and all that we can, we, we can um, use to utilize it. Um, that is me in a nutshell. I'm going to take uh, an opportunity to take some few questions. I see we have some few questions. Allow me to just read that. Was the estimate uh, date while well, fully aware that it may ch uh, it may change, but would be good to know uh, what the goal is. As I said, um, Estienne, Stan, thank you for the question. We really aim to start in February. As I said, we are ready. We are ready to do the first class. We just need to get the information. Um, and then from Tebuho Mabusa is asking, more or less, when will the course start? Yes hopefully before the end of February, but uh, March will not finish without the course starting. Uh, thank you so much. Another one from Lona Chongweni. Thank you for the question. In terms of accreditation, is the program accredited? No, the program is not accredited, um, Lona. Thank you very much. I don't know, okay, there's another question that came through. What are the payment terms? Um, we have the three payment terms that we will be communicating with you. Um, and that we are also going to, to gain an understanding from what the delegates are saying. As I said, the form is very into detail. It will ask you, um, do you prefer lump sum? Do you prefer a six months payment? Do you prefer three months payment? So once we get all that information back, we're going to then relay it back to, 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 the, to the delegates. We have another question from Tewuho Mabuza. Will the cost be contact or virtual. Um, with the current situation where we are in, we have planned that it be virtual. And um, the course has always been uh, the plan that it, it would be it would be physical, but due to COVID, we have planned that um, it's delivered virtually. Thank you so much. I don't know if there are any more questions. Uh, Mr. Mafuna, we're still within our time of an hour uh, in the session. Uh, my session was really not a lot. I'm done with the administration. So maybe uh, while we wait for, for more questions, I don't know if you'd like to add anything, sir. Um, if you don't have yeah. anything to add, um, you know, I may say my thank yous and my gratitude and uh, we'll be well on our way to sending that communication to the, to the people that are on the call. Okay. Back to you, uh, sir. Let, let me come in. Okay. Um, can you... Yes, I'll stop right. sharing. Can you see me? Yes, uh, I can see you. Right. Um, well, I think my, my approach is uh, one that we should use um, 2021, uh, at least up to about June, as a, a, a learning um, period, uh, not be too hard and fast. Um, because we are trying to offer it jointly with the BMF. This program has been on the go since 2008, and we've been offering it to large corporations. Um, if you ask anybody that has been um, at a Transnet, for example, various of the, the um, uh, operations, a lot of the people have been through this and you can check with them, they will, they will, they will tell you how it works. Uh, it's a hands-on thing. Um, you know, we have in the past uh, been able to negotiate with uh, overseas colleagues uh, at uh, Harvard University, Kennedy School of Government, uh, to come in and help us um, present the material. We stopped because uh, we discovered that they are coming from, you know, the top, top university in the world. And they come into South Africa, where we still have a, a, a lot of learning deficits in terms of, you know, we come from a, 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 an education system that taught us how to, to, to learn by cramming, memorizing things, and then less, uh, teaching us to, to learn how to analyze or work on your own or work in small groups. But we are trying to address this particular issue 
Um, someone said, for example, is it all going to be virtual? I think we should find a, a way, uh, the sooner we do that, where we got small groups of people coming um, together because you learn when you are um, interacting with other people. If we only stayed virtual, it's going to be quite tricky. Um, you know, talking into the void, uh, not really having to, to share with other people. I am quite sure that by the end of this year or next year, we should be able to uh, go back to a system where you have a combination of virtual as well as um, uh, in person. The, de the design of this program is such that once you've gone through the, the, the group, the workshops and all that, once you've done that, the bulk of it is one-on-one. -on -one. It's where we are working with individuals to, to get them to work through the material. So it is customized to work at an individual level. Um, I think those who are, who are anxious to say, well, when does it get started? I would like us, you know, I'd invite you to enroll. Let's, let's run the first few foundational workshops um, where if you look at the program, you will see the kind of stuff that that's we're going to be dealing with. There's a lot of um, assignments in terms of reading, um, following up stories, uh, following up chap chapters from here and there. We don't just come together and talk for the sake of talking. We are going to talk to a theme. We're going to talk to a topic. We're going to deal with um, case studies um, where rather than say to an individual, go and work through this case study on your own. Maybe we get two, three people to go work on a chapter or a case study or an aspect of you know, this level of Nelson Mandela's upbringing, or you compare it with say one of the Kennedys or Frederick Douglass or many other people. There are many stories in South Africa that have, have been, been told. And I believe that through this work, we will be able to, to document, memorialize the experiences of men and women whose, whose, whose leadership contributions are being ignored. There are people out there in society. It's just that we, we rush for those you know, who are at the top of the tree. You cannot be Nelson Mandela. Yeah? The, the best you can is to learn by looking at his material, how he overcame small personal challenges. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Um, we have some few more questions. Allow me to read them through. Um, some of them I know um, that you just answered right now. Okay, and then uh, Kirsten Stein says, will there be multiple lectures or only Mr. Mafuna? There will be multiple lectures and there's another very interesting concept um, that this program is bringing in where the, the delegates or the students will also get a, an opportunity to, to teach other, uh, other students in the class. Um, it's a whole leadership uh, tool that we also learned in, in, in the, in, in, in the uh, training towards uh, offering this program. Um, so whether you would like to be part of, uh, of the teaching staff or not, you will be able to, to indicate in this form that we are going to send out to, 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 the, to the guests today. And then do we get books or 10K is only for courses? Uh, 10K is for the course, you will get material um, as well. Um, I'm going to just be quick so that Mr. Mafuna maybe can also um, add on to that uh, course material that has to come with the course. And then how is the program structured? The classes, are they going to be evening or daytime? This is from Mangaliso. They are going to be um, what the consensus design, decides. As I said, we're going to collect all this information and, uh, and determine uh, what time will suit the, the collective in that time. Um, does it have any recognition in the market though, uh, Tabiso? I believe that the uh, Mr. Mr. Mafuna uh, gave a brief uh, background of where this program has been given out. 
um, he mentioned Transnet. And also, I think maybe when I give the opportunity to Mr. Mafuna, he can also uh, weigh in onto that question. Is the, is the course accredited by SACA any, anybody? Uh, no, the course is not accredited, said um, so. Then from Busim Taba, will the classes be conducted after hours? Um, I believe I have answered that question. Will this course clash with young professional development programs in terms of timelines? Um, we don't believe so, um, but we are going to be able to see that once the schedule has been drawn up. Then from Kingston again, will the number of the participants be kept at a certain uh, number? I, I believe um, that will not be the case because we might find that we are having different classes due to the different levels of understanding when it comes to the, to, to, to the leadership concept. As we said, we are going to analyze the, the forms, the data that we get from the forms. We, okay, and then from Kisten, slightly concerned about the topic and duration though, all the topics seems relevant. So I would argue to get real value, you would need to be part of everything. Uh, when I hand back to Mr. Mafuna, I'm going to ask you, sir, to please just maybe address that one. Okay, and um, yes, I think those are all the courses. We are left with six minutes until uh, seven o'clock. Uh, Mr. Mafuna, I would hand back to you maybe to address just those three questions, and then um, I'll have the opportunity uh, to close the meeting. Thank you so much. Back to you, sir. Uh, thank you. I think, um, you know, they're very important questions people are raising, um, and I think we need to make time to, to answer them. Um, the fundamental one that you know, we have been dealing with uh, from day one is the issue of accreditation. Um, this program, it's, um, it comes from um, where we, we borrowed the material uh, from the Kennedy School of, of Government. Um, we got the material from Profeta, Professor um, Ronald Heifetz. Uh, we've had his colleagues come to South Africa and, and, and work with us. Um, we had attempted to get accreditation from the material. Harvard does not allow um, anybody that uses their material um, to, to, to use it for accreditation. To my recollection, we possibly are the second um, organization uh, that is a, a Kennedy School of Government as, as Association that was given the, the permission to use the material. So for starters, we can't do that. However, I don't think we should just, you know, shut the story and say uh, no accreditation. Accreditation is so much a South African story um, that, you know, companies, when we started, companies said to us, you know, do you have accreditation? Uh, do you have a, a, a tax exemption? And we went and got all those stuff. We went and, and get an accreditation for collaborative leadership program. Um, we've abandoned the accredited uh, route. Um, the best way we could do that would be maybe if we work through um, academic institution, partner with a university. There are a lot of universities, for example, in the free state, uh, and vendor and, and Teflop, my alma mater, uh, they're very keen to work with us. And I'm quite sure even the, the, the previously white um, uh, institution, your vets, uh, Gibbs and others, uh, I've lectured there on, on this material. I think it will be to, that's a BMF issue. If you want to have certain material or aspects of this program, um, accredited. I'm sure we can resolve that. Personally, I don't go for accreditation because accreditation meets a totally different need. It's for those people that still want are uh, studying or they want to get credits for their academic qualifications. Even at Harvard where they teach this program, you don't get to write exams. There are no exams. They are very strict. Out of 800 applications, for example, they end up with 40 students. So 
we need, we are in South Africa. We can't just say no accreditation, but I would love to see, I'm, I'm, I'm open-minded. Let's see which as, aspects of this material, because there's a lot that we've developed ourselves that we can see if we can get accreditation. My particular inclination is that we miss, we miss the point completely by chasing accreditation. Um, it doesn't, accreditation doesn't teach you to master the art of applying yeah, this, this, this material. I am prepared to have a, a, an argument with anybody. I'm prepared to come and sit down with you and show you all that stuff. Those people who are looking for accreditation are looking at the wrong course. This course is not going to give you that. This is about making you, helping you be, you know, unleash yeah, the skills, the capacities um, of being a leader so that you improve your, 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 the, the caliber of your character, you improve your performance. It is not the accreditation. Those who are looking for accreditation, they're welcome to go to Gibbs and other places where they give those kind of courses. We, we have given up the accreditation. I am um, a qualified mo moderator. I'm a qualified facilitator. But when I look at the, the requirements, and the and the way the accreditation, I mean the the um, yeah, you end up giving accreditation. When I look at the program, uh, it's not worth the problem. I'll give you an example. We had sixty six uh, participants enroll over two years, eighteen months to be precise, or on a, a, a collaborative leadership program. We had all the qualified moderators and, uh, and, and uh, facilitators. At the end, when we moved towards accreditation, we only had four participants qualified, got the accreditation. The rest fell by the wayside because of the technicalities of accreditation, moderation and all that. The universities um, have got a handle on this, they do it far better than you know, management consultants. I still want to see a management consulting company that does accreditation on their own. If you're gonna do it properly, join up with the university. And I'm saying, I'm keen for us uh, to work through uh, you know, um, academic institution to see which elements we, we can because there are individuals who have got are justified, they want to improve their, their, their course. Um, otherwise, you know, I'm available to work with the team at the BMF to see where we, we, we can go with this. Uh, Shumani, sorry, just to round up, you talked about uh, uh, like people are going to facilitate and all that. It comes from the program that we, we, we got from Harvard. The teaching method is called case in point. It is simply says, when you work with adults, and most of the people we're gonna be working with adults here, the, the method of teaching, the method of learning, it's very different from when you work with students. Adults learn better by teaching others. So we are going to open this, um, the opportunity for participants to be able to teach. Um, you stand up in, in, in a workshop or in class and teach the, about the concept that you've learned or fascin fa fa fascinated you. So everybody will have the opportunity uh, to learn this. If you, again, you look at the learning that you did at the playground as a child, most research has shown that more than 70% of effective learning did not take place in the classroom. It took place when you were playing with your colleagues. Your colleagues, or even you yourself, uh, was able to teach or learn from your peers on how to do things. So we, we are really um, reinventing the wheel 
all we are saying here is the best way to learn this material will also by teaching. I'm only giving you possibly five or 6% of what's in the program. Yes, we have a number of people that will call upon who are party partners of ours who are going to be teaching. But I'd love to see some of the, the participants uh, come up the ranks so that they can teach the material. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, sir. Um, thank you so much for, for staying on to the call. Um, I really appreciate um, the, your presence in the call today. I just want to say thank you again to Mr. Mafuna for being uh, part of the program and the, and the team at the African Leadership Development. Um, I know some of you may have heard of Martha Mabena, so do expect some emails from her. Uh, we work together in the programs department and uh, I can never leave this um, platform without mentioning um, Mondenlovu, uh, Mr. Philip Bakakotela, Dr. Swing who was part of the of the of the of the master classes that happened last year that really set path for for this program today thank you so much to the marketing team and everyone really at the bmf um, house we look forward to seeing your 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 application uh, the communication is going to uh, to come out if you have any questions at all about what we covered here today or things that we didn't get uh, to cover please do feel free to 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 uh, email us um with that thank you so much um have a good night thank you